So it's the, the relationship of the amygdala to fear is not as stated in basic emotion theory that it's a hardwired experience. What's hardwired is the behavioral responses. So welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, this is the Anagogi Podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to release uh, yet another episode and yet with another uh, amazing guest. Uh, today we have Joseph Udir. Uh Joseph is a very, very reputable uh, neuroscience. He has done tremendous work on effective neuroscience, particularly uh, fear uh, and anxiety. Um, I will let him introduce himself a bit in, in more detail, uh, but welcome. Dr. Lidu, it's 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 really a pleasure to to have you here and that and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Tiago. Nice being here. Awesome. And can you, can you just like give a, a quick introduction about you know who you are uh, in your work if people just never never came across your name before? Sure. Uh, um, my name is Joseph Ledoux. I'm a professor of neuroscience at New York University. Uh been at NYU most of my career since uh, 1989. Uh, I've worked on primarily uh, during during my main body of my career. I've worked on, as you said, fear and anxiety primarily in animal models and trying to assess the implications for uh, human fear and anxiety. And um, before that, though, I studied split brain patients and got interested in the question of of consciousness because when you study split brain patients, that topic naturally comes up. Uh, what happens when you split the brain? I don't know if you want to go into that at the moment or you want me to just talk more generally right now. But, uh, that's kind of like the big picture. I, I started out studying consciousness, went on to uh, focus on <clears throat> animal behavior, and I can explain why I did that after studying humans. Um, but throughout my entire career, I've written about consciousness uh, as well. The other thing I should mention is I have two degrees in business, uh, which I uh, just I studied business because I didn't know what else to do in the late 60s, late 1960s, um, and then fell in love with um, uh, the work that a professor of mine was doing uh, on brain and behavior because uh, I didn't even know you could study the brain. And so I quickly switched fields at that point. So that's kind of uh, the big picture. Perfect. Um, yeah, that, that that really helps. Um, so, and I, I really love the the topic of, of consciousness, and and I hope that uh, we managed to to get into it. But I actually wanted to start with with emotion itself because this is a topic that has been uh, fascinated me for for quite a while, and also it's a topic that, that confuses me. Uh, and so the fact that I can uh, talk with a, with a world expert on on, on emotion that's actually you know quite quite an opportunity. And so I would like to dive a little bit. Um, on that, and from from my own reading, um, out of how I've uh, framed uh, this topic, is uh, and obviously this is a bit of a of an oversimplification, but let, let's use it as as a general framework. So, on one hand, we kind of have the typical view of emotion, uh, which you know supposedly derived from uh, evolutionary theory theory that emotions are universal, you know, deeply rooted. Um, in in biology through an evolutionary uh, process, and so for each of the basic emotions that we have, you know, there's an underlying uh, neural circuit uh, for that that we've developed, you know, over millions of years in order to to react to to the environment. Um, and usually, this is kind of associated also with the fact that um, you know our emotional expressions um, show up through facial expressions as well, and this is supposedly uh, universal and also body language and things like that. Um, and then, as opposed to that, there then there's another view, uh, which is kind of like I forgot exactly how it's technically named, but something like a constructivist uh, theory of emotion. Uh, this was, uh, I think, gotten very popular lately, lately through uh, Barrett. And then supposedly, you know, our emotions are are not universal um, or pre-wired uh, in our brains, but you know, they're they're constructed and they depend on. On culture, on on society, on on personal experience, and there's not really 
neural circuits that I dedicated for emotion per se, but it, it's more so that we just have general networks that just happens to deal with our general, you know, cognition and perception and things like that. And so g- given this kind of like two frameworks of, of how to view emotion, I, I would like to know a little bit more on, on kind of like how, how you are positioned uh, in this, because from, from what I read um, about you and, and your work, uh, you do reject kind of like the typical uh, model by uh, Banksep. Uh, so you, you do think that there's kind of like this 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 cognitive element, but I'm not sure if you're kind of like totally on boards with a with a constructivist theory or or if there's some kind of of disagreement there. Well, let's start at the beginning because um, I've been involved in not just emotion, uh, not just fear and anxiety, but emotion in general since I was a graduate student in the late 1970s, um, studying split brain patients. And what um, what led me to the topic of emotion um, was the fact that, well, let me tell you a little bit about split brain research because I think that's important for co- sort of conceptualizing and, and framing this whole discussion we're having. Right. Um, the, in a split brain patient, the two, hemispheres have been separated in an attempt to prevent seizures from spreading back and forth across the the two sides. So in these patients, you typically, uh, as in most people, you typically have language on the left side of the brain. uh, And on the right side of the brain, you have a lot of, you know, nonverbal functions that um, uh, can't be articulated linguistically. So when you are talking to the patient, you're talking basically to its, the patient's left hemisphere. The right hemisphere, lacking language, is unable to comprehend what you're saying. Um, but you can put uh, pictures into the right hemisphere. For example, a picture of an apple, by like presenting it to the left visual field, that will send it to the, to the uh, right hemisphere. And when you do this, the, you ask the person, what did you see? Again, you're talking to the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere didn't see anything, so he says, I didn't see anything. Um, But if you show the patient a sequence or a a collection of objects, um, the patient's left hand can point to the apple and not the banana or screwdriver or whatever else you put there uh, and accurately identify what it saw. It just can't talk about it. So... We had a patient who was somewhat different. Uh, this patient um, could read in both hemispheres, but could only speak out of the left. So this this offered an opportunity to address a longstanding question about split brain patients. And could it could you possibly have two people, one you know, two kinds of consciousness, one on each side of the brain? Uh, and without language, it's hard to assess that. And that's why it's so hard to study animal consciousness as well, because without language, you can't really uh, assess what, what they are aware of. Um, the, um, um, in this patient who was able to read in both hemispheres, we could ask him, who are you, by presenting words to the left hemisphere. When, uh, sorry, to the left visual field, the words go to the right hemisphere, and the right hemisphere can't verbally respond, but it can use the left hand to spell the answer. So, for example, if you put the words, who are you, into the right hemisphere, the left hand in this patient spelled P-A-U-L. His name was Paul. So, all, all of a sudden, you have a right hemisphere that is self-aware. It knows who he is. Um, and of course, the left hemisphere knows who he is and uh, has, has had lots of conversations with, with us. And so we know a lot about what the left hemisphere is like and what's on its mind, but not about what the right hemisphere is like. So being able to put words into the right hemisphere was a game changer. Uh, and not only was the right hemisphere um, conscious of who he was, but it had a goal in life, an ambition for the future. This ability to project ourselves in the future is another feature of human consciousness that's very important. So the right hemisphere wanted to be a, a race car driver, but the left hemisphere wanted to be an architect. So here we have 
the same name is, is possessed by both hemispheres, but each has a different goal in life. Now, I don't want to make too big a deal out of this because it's one patient and, you know, a small set of uh, questions that were asked to the patient, but it gave me the, the, uh, the sense that what's important in, uh, in understanding the mind is to understand how the sense of self and how the sense of the future uh, comes about in all of us. So one of the, the interesting, most interesting examples of all this that we did was we put two pictures, one in each hemisphere simultaneously. And then we asked the patient to, well, we just put two pictures over there and then we gave some choices in terms of, of pictures on the outside. So on the, in the right visual field, going to the left hemisphere, um, was a chicken claw. And in the left visual field, going to the right hemisphere, was a snow scene. So as soon as he saw that, the left hand pointed to a shovel and the right hand to a picture of a chicken. So we said, why did you do that? And we're talking to the left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere says, well, I saw a chicken claw, which it did. And you need a shovel to clean the chicken shed because chickens are messy. You, know, you got to clean. It was a country boy, so he knew you had to clean the chicken shed. But the left hemisphere uh, was confabulating, telling a story, writing, creating a narrative of what happened, because it was using the fact that the right hand was well. They didn't have to use the right hand because the right uh, visual field, left hemisphere, knew that there was a chicken. So he pointed to the chicken. The interesting thing is why he was able to say the left hemisphere was associated with a shovel. Um, um, but the left hand was left uh, associated with the shovel. So what he did was uh, he confabulated an, an answer that made it consistent with the right hand response. So you see a chicken and you see a shovel. So what do you, what's the connection? You put the two together. If the, if the left hemisphere didn't have that outside answer, it would not have uh, been able to respond. If the right hemisphere were able to talk, it would say, uh, I need a shovel for this to clean up the snow, not the chicken shit, because that's what the right hemisphere saw. So the basic idea was that in all of us, um, we feel that we have free will. And we, when we um, see our body performing a behavior that is inconsistent with what we think we know about ourselves, we have to come up with a narrative to make sense of it. Because the our whole idea of free will is based on the idea that we choose what to do. If our body is producing all these behaviors that we haven't chosen, then we can't say that it's ours. So to protect this kind of uh, uh, unity of consciousness, we generate these confabulations or stories or narrations to make our lives make sense. And the idea we had that about the, this experiment was that emotion systems might be one of the systems that unconsciously generates behaviors that we would need to reduce the, uh, the side effects of seeing our behavior being produced unconsciously uh, by making a story up about why we do it. So imagine you're having a, 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 a disagreement with your partner partner in life. Um, and we've all had those kinds of disagreements. Um, and you find yourself going down a road and it's too late to reverse it. So to protect yourself, you defend the argument that you're making. Or you might say, instead of going down that road, you might catch yourself going down that road and say, oh, I'm sorry, I should have uh, I should have said X, Y, and Z instead. I didn't mean to offend you, something like that. So these narratives are very important in our lives. And sometimes when we get stuck on a narrative, we, we really get stuck on it and it's hard to go back on it. We see this throughout culture today in life that uh, we have so many cultural narratives that people are so strongly adhering to that it sometimes creates uh, uh, social and political problems that, that we defend our, uh, our cultural identity, whether you are, you know, so whether you are uh, uh, a right-wing person or a left-wing person, you tend to defend your cultural identity. Now, all of this is by way of saying that because I decided that emotion systems might be important, 
Um, I turn to rats because I believe that the systems that control emotional behavior in rats and humans was the same. And I still believe that that's the case, that uh, the circuits in the animal brain that we've inherited from our animal ancestors, uh, in the human brain that, that we've inherited from our animal ancestors, are similar. Um, we have the amygdala for controlling defensive behaviors, uh, hypothalamus for controlling aggressive uh, behaviors, um, other parts of the amygdala and, and hypothalamus controlling maternal or sexual behavior. So there are different circuits for each of these kinds of behaviors. In that sense, I think the basic emotions theorists are correct. There are innate circuits that control behavior, but where I part from them is that I believe that the conscious experience of an emotion is a narration that we spin to tell ourselves stories to make our emotions make sense. Um, and you know, it's often said that emotion is uh, emotions are the same around the world. Well, I don't think that's true. What's the same around the world is situations. So we have situations in which we find ourselves um, that uh, cause you know, dangerous situation. Every culture has some kind of danger in it. And so when we're in danger, we generate a narrative about danger. And that narrative is personal so that what I know of as fear is not what you know of as fear. Uh, because we've had different life experiences and we've accumulated knowledge about what fear is and what danger is. Um, and those become the template, the kind of conceptual template out of which we generate our emotional experiences. Um, now, our cultural, uh, our, our personal narratives, our personal understanding, our personal schema that underlie all of this are um, uh, constri constrained to some extent by the culture in which we, we live. So different cultures have different understandings of what fear is or what love is or what happiness is. And so it's not the emotion, the, the conscious feeling that is shared across the world, but the situations that are shared. And because we have words in every culture that we can translate across languages, uh, we, for example, we say fear, and you can translate that into uh, most other languages uh, into some kind of word that makes sense in that culture. But the experience that the person is having does not necessarily go along with that translation. And I think a large problem with, for example, um, say interactions at the United Nations is that you have cultural schema that are shaping the way people interpret words. If you have a diplomat from uh, Russia, for example, listening to a diplomat from uh, the United States or France or Germany or whatever, uh, the the language is not conveying the the emotion. The language is conveying the kind of the, the, the word, but not the kind of feeling that goes with that word. Uh, it's a completely um, separate thing. The process of emotional behavior and the process of emotional experience are quite different. The behavior is largely innate in many sense, instances, for example, freezing to a snake, but the conscious experience of fear in that situation where you're freezing to a snake is a cognitive interpretation. Uh, in modern times, like recent years, this has become known as a construction. Uh, and there have been constructive theories in sociology, philosophy, you know, for, for quite some time, uh, and even in psychology. So the idea of, of construction is not new at all, but um, it, it's new in a sense as applied to emotions. I think uh, there was a sociology, sociological philosopher, a psychologist, I forget his name, Ron Hamray, I think was his name. And he wrote a book on the social construction of emotions in the 1960s. So that idea has been around, um, but in terms of basic, you know, not basically, but in terms of emotion theory, it's become much more popular uh, through the writing of uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett. And in some sense, you could say I was a constructionist uh, since the 1970s, but I, I don't usually necessarily use that term. I use uh, the terms that we talked about in terms of flip brain patients in the 1970s, interpretations, narrations uh, that provide templates 
uh, that that are, that that result from these kind of templates we have about what emotions are. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer to your no, rather that, simple that, question. That that was wonderful. I, I really appreciate, it. and it's it's really yeah. helpful to have the, the the background context of the split um, uh, split brain experiments uh, as well. Although something that that still kind of confuses me a little bit, and I, I still got this reaction from the first time that I heard kind of this type of argument from from Barrett, which is like, okay, you can say that the environment is is the is the const, constant, and it's basically just a, a circuit that um, doesn't necessarily have the emotion, but it's just it's just controlling behavior that that's appropriate for for a specific situation. You, you can say that. But why, why detach the emotional feeling from it? Like j just because that there is contextual variation, I don't quite understand why that undermines uh, an actual emotional fear circuit. Because I th I, to me, at least, it's still coherent to say that you have a fear circuit that is an actual I emotion and kind of like the fullest sense that goes beyond behavior, but that it's still context dependent like to me they're not mutually exclusive well you have to get into the data because for example um you can be for example let's say you um this was in the, in the 1960s a clinical psychologist named peter lang um made an important point which is that if you look at the uh behavioral physiological and subjective um, components of emotion, those things do not co-vary very well. Do um, you follow that? Yeah. In other words, you might have high heart rate, but uh, not be freezing and might be afraid, but or you might be freezing, but not afraid. You know what I'm saying? All the, yeah. the, the, the physiology, the behavior, and the heart, and uh, the subjective experience can co-vary, uh, can be dissociated uh, and not be that closely tied to each other. Uh, number two, if I present a picture, and talk about the amygdala, if I present a picture of a, a snake to you, or a spider, for example, um, mm -hmm. subliminally, so that you don't know the stimulus is there cognitively, we can't talk about it. When, you, when the stimulus is presented and you're asked, did you see anything? You say, no, I didn't see anything. Um, or she said, what did you see? And the person said, I didn't see anything. But that stimulus goes to the amygdala. And if you have the person in a magnet, fMRI, the amygdala is activated. The person's heart beats fast, their muscles tense, but they have no fear. They don't report any fear. They don't even know what the stimulus is. So you don't need a representation, a conscious representation. Sorry, the... the, the Processing of the, the stimulus uh, is sufficient to drive the amygdala to produce the behavioral and physiological responses. But that is not enough to give you the experience of fear. So if fear is coming out of the amygdala and causing the responses, why isn't that why can't you talk about what it is that the amygdala is doing in these experiments? In other words, you don't have any fear. There's no fear that's elicited by a subliminal stimulus, yet the amygdala is activated and triggering a response. So if the amygdala is the source of fear, then it shouldn't, you know, you should be afraid when the amygdala is activated and producing the response. But we can show that the person is not activated. Even if you push them and say, are you sure? Can you, do you feel any emotion? They say, they don't say anything. So it's, the, the relationship of the amygdala to fear is not as stated in basic emotion theory that it's a hardwired experience. What's hardwired is the behavioral responses, behavioral and physiological responses. Um, so, you know, in a sense, I'm, um, I'm a behaviorist, I'm a, or you could say I'm a basic emotion theorist when it comes to behavior, but I am a interpretation or narration or constructionist theorist, whatever you want to call it, when it comes to the experience of emotion. We also know that the damage to the amygdala um, uh, 
doesn't necessarily interfere with the experience of, of various emotions. So Liz Phelps demonstrated this in, uh, I think, 2002, and then a, uh, a paper from uh, Adolf's researchers were, uh, showed that they could induce, for example, panic feelings in a patient uh, um, without an amygdala. So you don't need an amygdala necessarily to have all these experiences. I mean, that's one patient, so again, it's, it's not a, a slam dunk. But there are just, uh, just lots of reasons why um, the basic emotions thing is not right in terms of, not correct in terms of the experience of emotion. Another one is that Drugs that are supposed to um, help treat problems with fear and anxiety do a much better job in changing emotional behavior and physiological responses than they do in changing subjective feelings. Uh, people do not necessarily feel better when they're given certain anti-anxiety drugs. They are just, you know, less. Uh, for example, if you have a patient with social anxiety, the patient is less avoidant, is able to go to the party a little easier. Um, and while there, can use the uh, the uh, situation on the on the drug because they're less aroused, less of, uh, less hyper aroused than they would normally be, and less avoidant. Um, but they're still anxious because anxiety is a state of mind about what's happening to you. Um, it's not a physiological state. It can be definitely be uh, affected by physiological states. We might say, okay, benzodiazepines are going. But benzodiazepine, you know, it, you feel a little better. But why is that? Well, most psychiatrists you'll, you'll ask the question to will answer this, that yes, it's true that the patient um, uh, is less anxious, but the patient is also, in general, emotionally depressed. It's a suppression of brain activity. You know, there are GABA receptors in every part of the brain. You take a benzodiazepine, it goes into your mouth, goes to your digestive system, is released into the circulation, goes to every part of the body, somehow magically finds the right part of the brain, and all of a sudden, no more anxiety. That's not going to happen. What happens is you turn down the volume of the brain because you've, you've increased GABA inhibition in the brain, throughout the brain. And so you're reducing that level of activity, and by turning down the volume, everything is a little less intense, uh, good and bad. So... You know, the, we have to, and, that, and that's fine. It, it, it helps the patient. But the question is, um, why does it help the patient? Uh, and is it, is it actually targeting a fear and anxiety center that we know to be the amygdala or whatever we think we know it is? Or is it because of this more generalized effect? And I think it's because of the more generalized effect. I see. Interesting. And uh, I've, I've, ta I've seen you talk about Kind of the, the issue of of, of anti-anxiety drugs, uh, and and I was a little confused by your argument, but but now I, I think I got it. That that definitely, you know, make, makes a lot of sense. Um, and j just coming back to what we're saying about you know circuits and whatnot, I, I just want to try to um, understand uh, how you view things. So like, is is the is the biological uh, neuro circuits that direct behavior are they below? Kind of what we can call um, what produces emotion, or do you view them as more like parallel? Um, so, so, how do you think of the system? Totally parallel and interacting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not that they do nothing. You know, it's like body feedback will affect your conscious experience, but it's a, that's a very blunt cue. I mean. Uh, it, it's it, you're not getting. I don't agree with Antonio Damasio's you know, um, feedback theory uh, that each emotion has a different kind of uh, you know kind of set of autonomic signatures. You know, because so Antonio will tell you that well, yes, yeah, some some situations the the signature, the body signature is not there, and the brain simulates it as if it were there, calls that an as if loop. But for me. All emotions are as if, because you don't need all of that stuff. What that stuff does it is like turns up the volume. Okay? That's hyper arousal. You change the level of arousal in the brain. That's going to affect your conscious experience. But where are you going to get the information about what 
that content should be about, well, from the situation in which you see yourself. I mean, this is plain you know, social psychology 101 from 1962, uh, Schachter and Singer and um, Leon Festinger. I mean, all our split brain research uh, interpretation theory thing was based on Leon Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance, that to see your body producing behaviors that you didn't intentionally produce as a conscious thinking organism uh, is a source of dissonance. And to reduce that dissonance, you have to generate a thought, a narration, to make that behavior make sense. Um, and so it's, it's really just a kind of social psychology, cognitive dissonance uh, uh, theory, attribution theory about why we have the feelings we have. They're not hardwired. They're just they're, uh, interpretations of situations that include body feedback and uh, all of the things going on at, at that time, not just the external environment, but the internal environment. But ultimately, it's an interpretation, a cognitive interpretation, based on your past history of other cognitive interpretations and other kinds of things you've learned about going through those kinds of experiences or that you've seen on TV or your parents told you about you know, that your friends told you about. You learn all this stuff um, and have that as a, a body of knowledge upon which you can extrapolate from to interpret the situation you find yourself in. Right. Okay. And so, for example, you know, I, I read, uh, uh, I saw a paper uh, by Cohen uh, and his colleagues. I, I think you were involved in some degree. I forgot. I, I don't think you were the author, but I think you were the editor or something, and they developed Who, like who's Cohen? Which Cohen? Ah, uh, I can't tell you. I'm sorry, yeah. um, but but they created a model with like 27 uh, emotions from like a, a video database that was like very very large, um, and that seemed to have pretty good reliability. Um, and I'm just curious about like that. That's a lot of e emotional states. So like, how do you view? That that entire collection, through kind of like context um, specific affect, like do you, do you see them has that I think you kind of call them like the, the conscious uh, feelings, mm -hmm. um, or do you think that so, so like I'm just trying to understand how you how you view that in relationship to like the the underlying circuits. So like, do you think that there's just Context specific reactions that you've learned through culture and, and experience and whatnot. And then they just like more or less randomly pick whatever behavior yes. we think uh, is appropriate. Or is this, or is there like some, some predetermined templates that we came, that we come with that kind of like seems to um, direct us to a way to those, you know, let's say 27 emotional templates, assuming that that would be a robust model. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not really. I don't know the paper you're talking about, um, but I, you know, I can imagine what it would be like. Um, so, um, first of all, I wouldn't say that anything uh, about, about a feeling is really hardwired, uh, a conscious experience of emotion. Um, I think it's it's all based on interpretation, um, and you know, an important component of all this is, of course, the words we have. Now. You don't need the word fear to have an aversive experience, but you need the word fear to have the experience that you understand as fear. In other words, you couldn't have a, a, a notion of fear without the word, because the word is taking a broad range of, of, of human experiences compressing it into one thing. I mean, there are so many different ways to be afraid. So let's let's talk about that for a second. You're walking along um, on a, you know, doing a hike on a mountain cliff, uh, something that's it's kind of dangerous, and the you stop to take a rest, and something happens, and your backpack falls off the, uh, the cliff. And in it was your food, your water and your coat. The sun is going down, uh, and you are now beginning to worry about what's going to happen. You're you're afraid that you know you're going to dehydrate, or you're going to uh, 
not have enough food. You you you, you, um, um, you know, suffer from lack of nutrition, or you might uh, be afraid of thermoregulatory problems overnight as the as the temperature drops precipitately. Precipitally, um, and so each of these is a way of being afraid. Uh, you can and say in an office situation, you can be. Uh, it can become quite anxious by something you overhear or you think you overhear about someone, about something that someone says you think about you. So there's, it's all interpretation that has led to the, the fear and anxiety you have about that situation now. Um, and you know, the, the amygdala is not the part of the brain that's controlling. The, well, let's let me put it in a positive. The amygdala is, uh, involved in fear and danger and so forth because it's a predatory defense circuit it's wired by evolution to detect dangers that uh, result from encounters with predators but uh, that's that's a very small and uncommon thing that humans experience in in daily life i mean you might say okay we have social predators okay that's an extrapolation um but it's not based on the sights and sounds of an innate predation situation. Uh, it's based on something that you've learned. A social predator is something you've learned about. Uh, and Pavlovian conditioning via the amygdala is useful for connecting stimuli, including stimuli about a social predator uh, with uh, the situation and allowing you in that situation to defend yourself. Now that's good, but that can also lead to kind of over defense because you find yourself being hyper aroused and alerted and and uh, re reacting uh, on the basis of some conditioning that you had that may or may not be valid in a more broader cognitive context. So, if we take the word fear in English alone, there's about I think thirty seven different words related to fear and anxiety. Now, that's a very big space, just that one word, fear. And so by saying, by using that word fear for that entire space, um, we are allowing ourselves a, a tremendous amount of range of possibilities for what fear means. And that's why we each learn what fear means. And we have to learn all those 36 or 37 different kinds of ramifications. But we call it one thing, we call it fear. So there's no hardwired state that is generating all 37 of those kinds of things, right? It, those are interpretations and based on language that we use language to carve up nature in a certain way. So we can have the experience we call fear, but that may not be exactly the same thing as the experience that we have. Uh, it typically might not be the same thing as, as when you might find yourself directly in front of a bear on a on a walk through the woods, uh, whether you have a, an immediately present danger or a mugger in your face and it's about to attack you. So um, those the the range of things we call fear. You know, you might even say, "I fear that uh, I've made a mistake." All right. So the the word is very very loose. I fear that uh, that uh, I'm not going to be able to make it to your party. That has nothing to. You don't really fear that. You're just trying to apologize for not making it to the party. But the words we have are very powerful, and we use them. And because we know that when I say I fear I won't make it to your party, you know I'm talking about I'm sorry I won't make it, not that I'm afraid that I won't make it. Uh, and so the language that we use are you know, chops up our lives in a way that we have a, 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 the ability to contextualize in the appropriate way. We don't mistake what we mean when we say fear of going to the party, or fear of that I won't make it to the party as opposed to fear of going to the party if, uh, if I have social anxiety. So I think that, you know, again, we can, we can experience what we know of as fear, but uh, without the word fear, we can't uh, experience what we call fear. So a child, for example, a preverbal child, doesn't have the word fear. It has, when you see a, a kid withdrawing or so forth, you say, oh, the kid, the child is afraid. But all you know about the child is it's withdrawing. 
Uh, so this is like you see a dog on the side of the road that's been hit by a car and it's howling and writhing and you know the legs are flapping all over the place. You see the dog's pain, you feel the dog's pain, but you don't see the dog's pain, literally. All you see are reflexes, the howling, the, the twisting of the legs. That's not pain, that's reflex actions. Pain is the, the subjective experience of pain is a psychological state that is an interpretation of all that stuff that's happened. Right. That, that was a lot. Let me try to let me try to to follow up um, on on the right place. Uh, but but that, that was a very helpful uh, breakdown. But it, but it's actually um, interesting that you mentioned the, the kind of the the dog example because that's something that I, I, I plan to get into as well of like attributing uh, emotional states uh, to animals as well. So for example, you know Barrett, you know often. Um, calls that kind of like the basic theory of emotion that they're just doing like a mental inference um, fallacy, right? Um, but they also find that there's kind of like an opposite fallacy of that where we kind of like undermine qualia and sentience to creatures which don't display, you know, as, as, as much intelligence. And we kind oh, of like rationalize their behavior has, you know, a, kind of like a simple... You know, physiological response just because it doesn't have the kind of the reflexive um, element um, of it, and so I'm just kind of even though what you said kind of like m makes sense, um, and, and and you know I'm positive that you know obviously dogs don't have uh, that, that there's a difference in, in the in the emotional states um, of of a dog compared to a human being, and certainly that there's there's a states of animals that we wrongly infer that they're emotional states when they're physiological responses. But I still feel like there is a, a danger of kind of um, overstepping. Um, and then, for example, I, I think like a, since we're speaking about dogs, for example, uh, Descartes used to do like live vivisections of, of dogs. Um, and he, he rationalized it in kind of, you know, in a very similar way, as, as you put it, which is like, these are just physiological responses, like th there's no actual pain because there's no reflexive element. And so I just feel like that that might be a, a very dangerous path uh, to go on. And I'm just curious exactly how do you try to delineate of when we're overstepping this or not? Well, uh, obviously it's important to err on the sake of, in the, sake, in the direction of caution, right? Um, when it comes to these topics. Um, you know, I have often been accused of denying emotions in animals. And you know, my point is, is much different, which is that I don't deny animals have emotions. What I deny is the, well, I won't say that. I, I don't deny animals have emotions. What I say is that it's impossible to know what they are experiencing. And the problem is that on the other side of the fence, the, those that are strong proponents of animal emotions tend to err in the direction of, and in the other direction completely, where they say they must have because I see it in their behavior. And, you know, if you're, if you're, I think either position in the, in the, the very strong taking of either position is wrong. You have to find a middle ground. And the middle ground that I find is to assume that a dog lying on the side of the road is in subjective pain, but we're not seeing that when we see the reflexive movements. So, and morally, the right position to take is that the dog is having an experience, something like what we might call fear or pain when, when we're in a situation like that, but certainly not exactly like what we call it because we, as we just discussed, we have words that chop up our experiences in artificial ways um, that are defined by the words themselves. Um, so the, you know, what I've tried to do is to use Endel Talving's three part partition of consciousness as a way to, um, propose a kind of 
empirical basis for uh, suggesting what like what consciousness might be like in other animals, especially other mammals. So, Tolving said uh, that we have three kinds of consciousness. One is autonoetic, which is basically self-awareness, self-consciousness. It's based on episodic memory. Um, the second kind is noetic consciousness. It's based on semantic memory. And the third kind is called anoetic consciousness, and it's based on procedural memory. So let's just suppose that the um, that the we that we understood in the human brain what was involved in autonoetic self reflect reflective self awareness, autonoetic consciousness on one hand, noetic consciousness on the other hand, knowledge of what things are and conceptual understanding of their relationships and so forth. And thirdly, um, anoetic consciousness, which is kind of the vague feeling of something is there. For example, in a human, anoetic consciousness would be in play when you walk into your apartment and um, you don't have to say, oh, this is my apartment. You consciously know it's your apartment at a level that William James called a feeling of rightness. Uh, but if you see your bookshelf has been turned over or something is amiss that you know shouldn't be there, that feeling of rightness about your life is uh, violated at that point. And you now move up into noetic consciousness where you see, you understand what it is that is causing you to feel unright because your bookshelf is turned over and looks like you've probably been robbed. And so all of a sudden you're also having an autonoid experience of, you know, this is my stuff and someone has invaded me. Um, and so I find that a very useful kind of partition. So let's say, and, and you know, Talving and others have said that autonoidic consciousness may be a kind of human uh, specialty. Uh, others say, well, maybe it, we can't know that it might not be in, in great apes, other great apes as well. And so that, you know, you can throw some flexibility in there. We don't know if it maybe is in monkeys as, as well, but, you know, the studies that have been done suggest possibly great apes, but you can't do brain research on great apes, so we can't really explore what I'm about to say. The idea would be that if we knew what, how autonoetic consciousness comes out of the human brain and noetic and anoetic, we would be in a much better position to then say, well, if the circuit in the human brain that makes anoetic consciousness is in the medial prefrontal cortex, and all mammals have medial prefrontal cortex, then all mammals might have anoetic consciousness. Now, what about noetic? Well, noetic is a little more complicated. Uh, and we know that lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a, a primate specialization, is able to semantically carve up the world, non-verbally semantically, carve up the world into uh, conceptual representations and so forth. That's not to say that other mammals don't have some kind of conceptual ability, but it seems to be more developed, more uh, widely, um, more exquisitely developed in primates. So let's just say for the sake of argument that lateral prefrontal cortex is required for that kind of high level uh, conceptual consciousness based on semantic memory. So you'd have semantic memory inputs coming into uh, being processed in, in the medial temporal lobe and lateral temporal lobe. And these would be feeding into lateral prefrontal cortex, but also to uh, some of the medial prefrontal areas like the anterior cingulate orbital uh, cortex and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Because in in, uh, in humans, we know the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is summing all of these different kinds of memories into a schema. And the schema can then be placed into working memory and used as a basis for decision-making and so forth. So working memory in, in monkeys and, and other primates is much, much more sophisticated than in animals that well, they have medial prefrontal cortex. So they have a prelimbic that can do some kind of working memory, rats and so forth. But uh, that's very different from what 
the granular prefrontal cortex, lateral prefrontal cortex sleep. So maybe a noetic, uh, sorry, maybe noetic consciousness is a kind of lateral prefrontal cortex specialization. And maybe that autonoetic being kind of human or grade eight like would depend on the part of the frontal lobe, the lateral frontal pole that is especially well developed in the human brain and, and somewhat unique. So then we would have an anatomical basis for reverse engineering what animals, what other mammals, what kind of consciousness other mammals may have, given what we know about what those kinds of consciousnesses require in the human brain. So that's my uh, idea about how to approach all of this. Now, you mentioned intelligence, but intelligence is different from consciousness. And this is a problem that's uh, rampant now in the AI world in the effort to find consciousness in AI. Um, this is a problem uh, because you know the Turing test turns out to be basically a test of intelligence more than uh, experience itself. And in AI, they often confuse intelligence with consciousness. So if you're going to find a way to find some kind of consciousness in AI, you first have to, uh, I think, better understand what's going on in, in, uh, in other animals, especially, let's say we just take rats uh, as an example. Um, if, if, we under, if we had a better sense of this anoetic consciousness, that might be something that would be possible to instantiate in a uh, an AI machine. I mean, they, all of, all of the kinds of consciousness you can instant, instantiate in some kind of mechanical um, or or learning based process that makes it look like it's conscious, but is it conscious? And that's the that's the tough problem. And so I think it's important to not jump all the way to like, okay, we're going to make a robot that is self-aware and uh, will know it's self-aware and so on. I, I just don't think, I don't see that. I believe that, that um, you know, human consciousness is the result of um, roughly 4 billion years of biological evolution and a gazillion, trillion, million, bazillion biological accidents. It just happened put that kind of scenario into play. And unless you can recreate the entire history of those accidents, I don't think you could come up with the the thing we call consciousness or, you know, uh, yeah, well, so with, with consciousness, because it's, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a bit of an elusive process that we have, we can study it in humans, but it becomes very hard to do it in other animals. And certainly, if we can't do it with precision in other animals, we can't do it with precision in AI. So I'm not a big fan of that uh, particular idea. Um, I think, uh, you know, and I, I get, you know, some people are interested in consciousness and octopus and bees and so forth. That's fine. Um, but, you know, again, how do we know how that relates to what we are actually talking about when we talk about consciousness? I think the important place to start and really focus on this within mammals. Because if we can understand and get to the bottom of consciousness in other mammals, that would be such an, uh, a real breakthrough that, um, and it would, be, it would be applicable to the animals that are closest to us. And as humans, we want to do the right thing uh, morally. And, you know, I, I'm much more comfortable giving moral rights to animals close to us than going all the way down to, you know, insects and, and other things. So I think uh, we're kind of coming to the close of my uh, time availability, so we may have to shut down pretty soon. Yeah, no worries. Uh, but I, I really appreciate that answer. And, and mm -hmm. I certainly agree with you with, with, with what you mentioned about intelligence and, and, and consciousness. And, and I, I view it exactly the same way. But when I, when I mentioned intelligence, it was just like the, the typical heuristic that people use in order to try to, you know, evaluate what, what animals are kind of capable of. Um, and yeah, and so there, there was a lot there, honestly, and I wish I could like follow up. In, I'm in sorry, I, I, I probably like rambled too much. No, no, it's, 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 it's great, honestly. And I had like so many topics. We went to about like 5% of, of what I have here. Uh, but as you mentioned, we're, we're kind of uh, at, at the end of it. So I just wanted to, to kind of add, um, uh, 
two two questions, and you can make them very very short if you want them. Um, one of them is like you have a very successful and very long career in neuroscience, and when you look back, like what do you think is is your proudest moments out, out of like th that entire history? Um, and also, how do you view um, kind of your life in music in relationship? To, to neuroscience, if you feel like there's a there's a commonality there that, that you're trying to explore, or if you just view them as kind of like two two interests of yours. Yeah, so I think the the thing that I'm most proud of is um, the shift in my perspective away from the idea or to the division between fear and the um, the fear itself and the behavioral and physiological responses that occur. I think that you know. We have a, a language problem in psychology and neuroscience that we take common sense words and apply them to brain circuits and so forth. And once we do that, um, it, it becomes, you know, it, it's hard to get out of it. So, for example, I'll tell you a quick story about uh, Pleasure Centers of the Brain. James Olds, 1956, published in Science Magazine. Uh, Olds, of course, discovered that you know, Ellis and Milner discovered self-stimulation in rats. And so, and this was presented to the public in Scientific America. Um, the word pleasure does not appear in the article itself. It's only in the title. And I'm very convinced, and I, I got some confirmation of this from Peter Milner much later, after both, after Ellis died, uh, that, that pleasure was not something that was they were uh, interested in reinforcement and they thought they'd found the basis of reinforcement. The Olds kind of got sucked into the pleasure idea after writing that article. Uh, and it became, you know, it became a, a, a kind of significant, legitimate scientific pursuit, pleasure in the brain. Roy Wise then created the dopamine theory of pleasure because dopamine was the uh, agent involved in the reinforcement of this, the self stimulation. And both Olds and Roy Wise later recanted the idea that pleasure was involved in dopamine and in self-stimulation. So, um, but once you, again, it's like once the cat is out of the bag, you can't put it back in. You will never get rid of the idea of dopamine and pleasure. Uh, just as the same thing as oxytocin and love. Um, I mean, oxytocin has some bonding thing, but that's different from love. Uh, that's not, oxytocin doesn't, Make us love it. It helps us on behaviorally. That's my opinion. So, uh, music. Um, I use my research and my knowledge of mind and brain to write songs about mind and brain. Uh, and I created a genre called heavy mental to do that. Um, and so, uh, but the, it's been unidirectional. I haven't found that the music goes back into my science. I haven't studied music in the brain. So, it's more. In, in one direction. Um, but I just want to just close with a couple of uh, things. One is that I have a new book coming out in October. Uh, it's called The Four Realms of Existence. And I'd be happy to talk to you about that and another one of these interviews if you'd like. Uh, and the other is a documentary came out about me uh, streaming on, on Amazon Prime. It's called Emotion. It's called Neuroscience and Emotion, the work, uh, life, so the life, work, and music of Dr. Joseph Ledoux. Uh, and it covers all bases, including my life growing up in Cajun country in South Louisiana. Awesome. I, I was just, I was just to, to uh, going to ask about, about your book, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to get my hands on it uh, once, once it's out. And the the documentary that, that you mentioned is it's it's the same the, it's the same one you you sent me right but I, I didn't watch oh, it on yeah. Amazon Prime it was something else right yeah so uh, it's now on Amazon Prime so it's, uh, the other the other things were like temporary like promos to get it out uh, but now it's on Amazon Prime and anybody can watch it uh, at least in the U S and Britain I'm not sure about other locations right right okay got it. Awesome this this was amazing like it's a it's a pleasure you know talking with you and it's 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 really. <laughs> An honor beyond belief to to just have an expert that just can cite you know just every evidence available from the from the top <laughs> of, his, of, of his mind. Yeah, um, 
I so, probably missed some of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. It, it it was it was truly lovely, and I can't wait to talk with you about about your book. So sometime soon.